On Line with Vetify and welcome to today's webcast. Why high yield bonds deserve your attention now. There's a lot going on in the fixed income market. We're going to tackle a lot of that today. We're thrilled to have our partners over at Bond Blocks sponsoring today's webcast. Some of the things we're going to dive into include why high yield may work in this market environment today. It's something definitely to think about. We know we have a lot of advisors and institutions going into this space and being more committed. Also, why precision is important when investing in high yield bonds. It's not the way it used to be and advisors understand that. And then most importantly, an overview of bond blocks, high yield ETFs that provide precision um, and, and the specific exposures that they provide and how you can utilize them in your client portfolios. Now, before we get started, a few housekeeping items, and I'll go through them quickly. If you've been with us before, you know we love getting your questions. So at any point in time, if you have a question, just type it into the Q&A section. We're gonna try to get to as many questions as possible towards the end of the presentation. And speaking of questions, uh, if you've been with us before, you know we love asking you questions in the form of polling questions that'll pop up on your screen. No wrong answers. And the fun thing is we share the results right away. You get to see how you stack up against your fellow advisors. Now, there are a lot of resources that are available in the Resource Center. Uh, there's a link to the Institutional Income Strategies channel. So go in and check that out. There's also a white paper on why precision matters in US high yield. There's a product guide about some of the things that we'll be talking about today. There's a mid-year fixed income outlook as well. All that's available for you. Go in and grab that. And then one quick favor I've got. Um, there's a clipboard icon that you can see. Click on it. There's a very brief survey. Honestly, it will take you less than a minute. But your feedback is key and critical to us, not only on the subject we're talking about today, but we use that to determine what we're gonna be talking about on future webcasts. So thank you so much for that feedback. We really appreciate it. And at this point, it's my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First, Joanne Bianco is a partner at Blonde Bond Blocks. Joanne, welcome, it's great to see you. Thanks very much, Tom. We're very happy to be here today. And you brought with you Ben Morris, who's a portfolio manager at Bond Blocks. Ben, it's a pleasure to have you as well. Thanks, Tom, it's great to be here. So, uh, Joanne, Ben, bo before we dive into it, look, uh, we here at Vetify have been huge fans of ETFs for a long period of time. We're big fans of innovation. We can't move on without making the point that you folks have been in this business for just a year and a half. In that short period of time, you've got over $2 billion in assets um, you've got to feel really good. Yeah, it feels good. And we're just getting started. Well, you are. It's interesting as you have more innovation and, you know, these are not your grandfather's ETFs. I mean, mm -hmm. the sophistication behind these ETFs are fantastic. And I know a lot of advisors are learning more and more about bond blocks and how they can utilize your strategies and client portfolios. So. I was very excited about today. Uh, I would say, Ben, like, look, you're in a great shop. Um, what are some of the most exciting things that you're seeing in, in the ETF space today, especially as far as what bond blocks is bringing to the marketplace? Well, I, I think it's it's really exciting how open the market is to some of the innovations that we're, we're rolling out. Um, you know, folks are really excited by new issuer coming to market with new ideas. And I think receptivity is is the big thing that comes to mind. Obviously, 2.1 billion in less, uh, about a year and a half, uh, you know, validates that point. But um, I, it, a lot of people want to work with us and, and see what we come up with next. Well, let's dive into it. Uh, and, and a great place to start is this polling question that you can see on the screen. How are you getting exposure to US high yield bonds today? Is it through individual securities? Is it index mutual funds and ETFs? Is it active mutual funds and ETFs? Or you don't currently have exposure to high yield bonds. So I'll leave that up there for a few seconds. 
Um, great. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone, for participating. Um, hey, not to put a gun to your head, Joanne, but if you were to guess which of these is going to get the most of the votes, A, B, C, or D, what do you think? I think it's a cross between B and C, to be honest. Okay. Well, let's, let's see. And you didn't even look. You didn't even look at the answers. That was gr that's great. So B, uh, almost 41%, correct? And then more and more active. And we're going to talk a little bit about that as well. So that's really, really important. OK. Um, so Ben, let's, let's jump in. What is the slide telling us? Well, Tom, I, before we get into the, the meat that Joanne's going to uh, dig into for us here, which is really interesting and hopefully valuable for folks. Uh, wanted to, to give a little bit of background uh, about why Bombbox came to market and who we are. And I, I think the best way to do it is to really take a look at, at the history of the ETF market and specifically high yield ETFs. So, you know, to do that, we only have to go back to 2007 when we had the first uh, high yield ETFs come to market. They were the broad market cap uh, indexes. Um, over the next five years, you saw a cool, a few cool innovations like your your first crossover ETFs or, or the Fallen Angel funds. You saw some short duration funds come to market. Um, I, I'd argue the the product innovation from there on was was relatively flat. You had a few ESG high yield funds come to market, and most of that growth in that that uh, light blue line that you see from 2013 to 2019 was was mostly new issuers coming to market issuing a lot of copycat ETFs or, or their own version of funds that have already been uh, pretty successful. Um, at the same time, if you look at the, the total AUM growth, uh, the, the dark blue line there, you'll see um, a pretty a pretty good steady increase in utilization of, of high yield ETFs uh, up till 2018, which was a, a rate hiking year for the Fed. Um, no surprise, risk off, people traded out of it. And then, you know, 2019 in, in asset growth is, is really a huge highlight here. Uh, assets more than doubled as the, the Fed cut rates from 2.5% to, to a quarter point by the end of the year. Um, and this dramatic growth is, is really what set the stage for bond blocks to come to market. So, um, you know, we here are a team of fixed income experts, like you're going to hear from Joanne in a minute about, and, and ETF experts. Uh, that's more of my camp. Um, and and the whole business was founded on the thesis that fixed income and ETF investors have been underserved relative to equity, uh, the, the development of the equity market you'll see especially. Um, and, and we think we could offer a lot of precision and um, better uh, efficiency for, for folks to express views in the fixed income markets. Um, so, so far we've launched 20 funds um, we have U.S. Treasuries, we have international credit and high yield, which we're going to talk about today. Um, and these really have opened up new innovations in the market so people can express new views in credit quality, duration, um, and sector exposures. Um, yeah. Ben, I think you're bringing up some great points. I mean, just a few short years ago, when you looked at total assets and fixed income, it was just a fraction of what we saw in overall ETF assets. Fast forward to this year, um, at one point in time, fixed income asset flow led equity asset flow, and, and still it's uh, a little less than 50-50. So uh, you, you've got to feel really good about the offering and your expanded offering, especially with the need for innovation and with all the challenges and opportunities in the fixed income space, right? There's a lot of opportunities, especially with yields uh, where they are today. And, you know, Joanne is going to get into for, for folks in the audience, you know, how they might be able to take advantage of, of some of these products or use these products to take advantage of these opportunities. So, yeah, um, well, let's we've got another polling question, folks, and, he, and here it is. What percentage of the fixed income allocation in your client's portfolio is currently invested in high yield? Is it zero, one to 10 percent? 10 to 25 percent or 25 percent plus so ben while uh while you're hot here what would you say if you had a gun to your head which uh for the 
for the majority of the advisors on here, where do you think the majority of or the, the their their high yield allocation would fall? I'm I'm guessing it's it's something like B or C, uh, and hopefully at the end of the call we'll be pushing people a little further down the the list there. Okay, all right. So let's see a few more seconds, folks. Excellent. Thank you. Wow. It B just ran away with it. Almost two thirds. Ben, what do you think? Uh, I'm not surprised. I, I think um, you know folks are have been on the sidelines with high yield, and um, I, I'm I'm happy that folks are in there. But uh, hopefully, we can see some growth in in that usage, especially as yeah. as the the rates uh, get cut in the future here. All right, Joanne. Uh, Walk us through some of the things that you're seeing today, um, and, and uh, I, I've been excited to hear from you. Great. Yeah, if you could just advance a couple of slides here to, yep, that's where we are. Um, so, yeah, the, uh, I want to answer the question of why now, and the way that I'm going to do that is I'm going to start with some of our conclusions first, and then we'll get into more detail supporting those conclusions and upcoming uh, slides in the presentation. And so starting with the first conclusion, you see here that despite the view still calling for a recession in the US before year end, we believe that there is a very limited chance of a recession through the end of the year. And we also think that the likelihood of a deep recession at any point in the near future, either through year end or into next year has uh, significantly decreased. And why is this so positive for high yield? Well, because resilient economic conditions are supportive of this asset class. They've translated into high yield corporate fundamentals remaining unusually strong for this stage of the credit cycle. Um, plus the all in yields for high yield remain compelling in our opinion. They're at levels close to double where they started last year. Uh, meaning that investors can generate elevated income just by owning high yield. And all this leading to our conclusion that investors should consider increasing their allocation to high yield, especially if they selectively pick their spots within the asset class. All righty. And so now so I can go into more detail about these conclusions. Um, yep, yeah, here we go. And so, yes, again, the likelihood of a deep recession in the U.S. has decreased, and our constructive view is supported by resilience that we see across a wide variety of economic indicators. Uh, specifically, the consumer is strong, still spending, unemployment remains low, the economy seems to be with, withstanding higher mortgage rates so far, corporate balance sheets generally remain strong, they're well positioned, even if economic conditions were to soften more from here. Um, of course, we still have to contend with the Fed's still unfinished rate hike campaign in terms of its cumulative effect that this has on the U.S. economy. This continues to be a wild card for economic health and then how that trickles down to high yield corporations. Uh, I, we think though that many market participants expected all these rate increases to have a more profound effect on the health of the economy by now. But what we're seeing, just it just illustrates the underlying strength in the economy despite all these rate hikes. So Joanne, you're, you're pretty much in the camp that we're going to have a soft landing and that if we do have a recession, it's not going to peak its head until 24? Exactly. Exactly right. Mm -hmm. That's that's our view. Okay, on the next slide, you see here, high yield in issuers entered uh, this year from a position of relative strength, and they remain resilient going into the end of this year. Um, and these strong fundamentals are a clear differentiator this time around in this economic cycle. And something that I really want to stress is someone who's been investing in high yield since the early 1990s. I've seen my fair share of cycles and how they impact high yield. So what you see on this slide is that high yield balance sheets remain well positioned with gross and net leverage levels still near pre-pandemic lows, 
interest coverage still near multi-year highs, and cash levels compared to debt still higher than average. You know, and although these measures have softened this year and could continue to soften in the um, coming quarters, the pace hasn't been dramatic, and and it hasn't caused a, a downgrade wave by the rating agencies. So all of this points towards continued solid fundamentals supporting high yield valuations. All right, and and the credit quality mix, what, what's right. jumping out at you? Yeah, so it just remains higher and better than prior to previous down cycles with close to 50% of high yield companies rated double B, a lower than historical average rated triple C. And again, we don't expect big changes here in the coming quarters. Okay. All right, and then if you're moving on, this is this is another source of market strength that high yield debt maturities re remain low over the next few years. And high yield issuers are continuing, continuing to actively address their near-term bond maturities. Refinancing has been the primary use of proceeds for the bulk of issuance uh, year to date. And you know that compares to previous cycles where you might have seen a lot more expansion capex or highly leveraged transactions. We're not seeing that. We're seeing refinancing. So all all this means is that companies are you know continuing to shore up their balance sheets. And if you move to the next slide, this is another indicator of the fundamental strength um, in that the distressed universe of high yield is low right now, only five, seven and a half percent of outstanding high yield bonds. And this is typically defined as the volume of bonds trading greater than a thousand basis points over treasuries. And you can see here that it's de de decreased in volume this year versus last year. And the composition of this hundred billion in distressed bonds, it's pretty concentrated. Over 50% of the current volume is in three industries healthcare, telecom, and cable, satellite. Um, outside of these industries, there's really low levels of distress and high yield right now. And plus there's nothing new on the horizon that we can see right now in terms of additional industry sectors that could meaningfully impact the distressed universe. A lot of people are curious about defaults, Joanne, and I know mm -hmm. you're keeping your finger on the pulse there. What are you seeing? Yeah, so this is other good news in, in um, my opinion, um, that we're not expecting to see a huge spike in corporate defaults anytime soon. We do think they could trend marginally higher towards Moody's long-term average of around 4%. Um, but you know that's something that in the context of current spread levels and valuations that the market could handle. And it's also in, indicative of the fundamental health that we see in high yield right now. I mean, I, there's probably more risk for default risk for leveraged loans than there are for high yield bonds, in our opinion, right now. And speaking of spreads, what are you seeing on that side? Credit spreads have tightened this year across the board. So triple C's have tightened the most over 250 basis points. I think it's actually 270 basis points. And we're not surprised that credit spreads are tighter this year considering the continued strength in corporate fundamentals and the lower likelihood of a recession you know, than even we thought at the beginning of the year. If you compare current spreads to long-term averages, they're right in line with the averages experienced during previous rate hike cycles because you know, the, when does the Fed hike? They hike during a strong economy to slow an economy down to reduce inflation. And it's just been a much more resilient economy this cycle and despite, despite these rate hikes. So we don't think the tighter spreads this year are unreasonable. And we also don't see any reason right now, absent some unforeseen shock that's always out there, um, why we couldn't see spreads trade in like a 400 to 500 basis point average over treasuries for a broad high yield index. Joanne, we're getting a lot of great questions and, and, and we've got a little bit of time. So let me just throw a few things at you. Um, the Fed, uh, I think, is happy in general with uh, the progress of fighting inflation, but it kind of signaled it might be higher for longer. Um, if they do have one or two more 
rate hikes in them as we get into 24, what might that do for credit spreads, especially if we start to see default rates sneak up a little bit? Well, it hasn't done a lot so far. I mean, that's always the worry, but you know, it, it just also, you do have companies that are not going out of limb in terms of how they're managing their balance sheets. There's going to be pockets of weakness. There always are, but um, they've handled it so far. And I, I think it's our expectation that they're not suddenly going to fall off a cliff. Do you think in general investors, advisors, or, or in even institutions uh, are too cautious at this point? I mean, uh, you see the amount of money that's on the sidelines, $7 trillion in money market funds. Um, where, okay, you're getting paid for it now, but we know at one point in time, if there is a recession, the Fed's going to come in, not with 25 bips every quarter, but they're going to come in with a machete and cut pretty quickly. Can you walk us through that scenario and what investors might miss if they've kept too much of their powder dry? Yeah, I think if you if you advance to the next slide, we can like definitely answer that with that. Um, yeah, a common theme we have heard is that investors are waiting for spreads to widen in high yield before increasing their allocation to the asset class. They fear that high yield bonds aren't pricing in bigger problems for the U.S. economy. You know, and all this waiting for spreads to widen has caused some investors to miss some of the opportunities that high yields already offered and it continues to offer. Um, so what we think is that investors should instead be focused on the attractive all-in yields for high yields, which you can see here by rating category and by industry sector. Um, they're still close to double where they started 2022. They still provide pretty attractive income generation for investors. And these higher yields would, in answer to your question, provide cushion for returns if spreads were to widen uh, with a weaker economy. So right now, you know, you're seeing over 7% on average for double Bs in the mid to high 8% range for single Bs and close to 13% for triple Cs. And we think investors with long term, longer term views should increase their allocations to high yield um, to take advantage of the type of income they can generate. Um, with this asset class. Of course, we think it's, it's important that um, people pick their spots and the specific risks that they're comfortable with, you know, because not all high, high yield risk is the same. Great, great point. Okay. And um, this is just, you know, more detail about like coupon income component in high yield being the, the primary driver of long-term returns in this asset class. So, you know, that's what this, this slide illustrates. Over the past 20, 10 and 20 year time periods, coupon income, which is the green portion of the bars, was the primary uh, driver of high yield performance, more than offsetting the drag from negative capital appreciation that took place over these time periods. And now with significantly higher interest rates and with coupon income generation component being close to double where it was, it gives this asset class a head start in terms of total return performance that it can generate. Yeah. Joanne, you've been at this for a while. You're a student of the markets, especially in the fixed income side. Um, mm -hmm. The yields that you're talking about are pretty attractive. We haven't seen something mm -hmm. like this in a while. Um, I, again, not asking for you to polish up your crystal ball, but um, I, uh, do you feel that there are a lot of uh, advisors and institutions that to some degree are trying to top tick rates uh, with the idea that if I can just time it at the right point, not only can I be able to capture some of that yield, but might be able to get some appreciation too. Um, and, and if so, what are some of the fallacies of that? Yeah, I, I, it, that's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to top tick anything. <laughs> so yeah. I think, you know, you just want to determine whether you want to be uh, participate and have exposure to the asset class and figure out your spots for doing that. And it, it is a good time. It's, it's a better time than it's been. Yeah. 
Well, I know you folks were enthusiastic about it. Here we have uh, another polling question. Over the past 10 years, how has high yield volatility compared to equity volatility? Has it been more volatile, just as volatile, or less volatile? Um, my guess is you're asking the question because you know the answer, but it'll be interesting <laughs> to see. What, what We'll leave that up there for a few more seconds so we can get all the advisors to jump in. And again, we're not going to call anybody out here. There are no wrong answers, but it's great to be able to know um, how people are feeling about it. So that's great. Okay, a few more seconds. Excellent. All right. Thank you, folks. So this is what the advisors on the call think. Less volatile, Yay. almost three quarters. <laughs> yep. And that is the right answer. Uh, you could go to the next slide and we can show you some statistics about that. Um, it does surprise some people, but it doesn't surprise this audience. That's good. Um, so over the past 10 years, high yield has been about half as volatile as the S&P 500 and less than half as volatile as the Russell 2000. Um, of course, you can see here that triple C's have experienced close to the same level of volatilities, equities, but they also generate more like equity-like returns. So it's just not surprising to us. Um, but both double B's and single B's have experienced uh, less than half the volatility of stocks. Excellent. Okay. All right. So let's talk yeah. about performance. Yep. Yep. High yield's gotten off to a really strong start this year. I think stronger than many market participants expected. Not only is it the best performing of all these broad fixed income asset classes and what we have up here, emerging market sovereign debt, uh, investment grade corporates, U.S. treasuries, and the U.S. aggregate, um, we're up over 7% for the ICE B of A high yield index. Um, but, and it also experienced the least negative return last year versus these other fixed income sectors. Once again, always just having this um, head start with its coupon income. Joanne, you, you've made reference to all in yields. We've got a couple questions on that. What do you mean by that? Well, the yield, the, the, the risk-free rate yield, the treasury yield plus the spread over treasuries gotcha. is the all in yield. <laughs> yep. Excellent. Okay. All right. And the, so this um, slide illustrates how the annual total returns generated by high yield industries have been overwhelmingly positive throughout their history. Um, again, I, I'm sounding like a broken record, but benefiting from this asset class is higher coupon income. There's only five down years over the past 26 that you see here only two of these years down greater than 5% last year and in 2008 with the great financial crisis. But look how much uh, high yield recovered after those tough years. And another point to make here that not everybody knows is that high yield has never experienced two negative calendar years in a row in its history. Um, this year's rebound after last year's negative year is a continuation of that trend yeah that's it's it's a great point joanne um we asked the question about um volatility compared to equity markets and um, especially with these yields i think you know uh, we've got a lot of smart advisors we've got a lot of smart institutions that are on board here for sure and and right. that's that's really key and critical however would you also say that the fixed income marketplace may be a little bit more predictable just because the, how it's tied to economic numbers versus equity markets? What's your take on that? I Yeah, I would agree with that assessment. Nothing's ever truly predictable. Um, um, we don't have a crystal ball for anything really, but um, there is a little bit more predictability, I would think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Um, this slide just shows that over longer term horizons, high yield has outperformed all these other major sectors of fixed income that I've shown, showing here, broad 
um, investment grade corporates, triple B corporates, dollar denominated emerging market sovereign debt, the aggregate and, and US treasuries. And as you can see here shaded in light blue, um, that double Bs have been the best performer the longer the time period under measurement. So outperforming all other fixed income sectors over the five, past five and 10 years on an annualized basis. Um, and the sharp rebound in triple Cs that we've seen so far this year have put it ahead year to date. And then now it, because of that strong performance year to date, it carries through the past one and three years on an annualized basis. Very, very All good. All right. Okay. So we're gonna talk about the case for precision exposure. What, what do you mean by precision? Uh, picking your spots amongst the credit rating categories or the industry uh, sectors. So if you advance to the next slide, you know, the, the high yield market has experienced um, wide variation in performance across its industry sectors and broad rating categories. That's why we spend a lot of time talking with our clients about looking beyond broad based high yield ETFs to establish more precision exposures within high yield. And, you know, this is basically the name of the game in creating opportunities for outperformance with high yield. If you move to the next slide. Yeah, so here you see high yield has performed very strongly this year. I think most surprising um, on this page is, is how well triple C's have um, performed up over 13% in total return through the end of August. And considering that triple C's still yield near 13%, as well as our expectation that the, the risk of a significant pullback in the US economy is limited over the coming quarters, we think triple C's could continue to outperform the rest of high yield. Um, in industries, consumer cyclical has been the best performing industry year to date, up close to 10%. And a cyclical industry doing very well in this environment. Um, and so, Another thing that you can just really see by looking at the slide is just how significant performance variation can be between the three main credit rating categories, which are the green bars and the seven main industry sectors, which are the blue bars. It shows how triple C's have outperformed double B's by close to 800 basis points year to date. And consumer cyclical has outperformed telecom, media and technology by over 450 basis points. And you know, there's no reason not to think that this variance in returns won't continue. And so what it does is it creates opportunities for investors to outperform broad high yield benchmarks with their credit quality in industry sector selection. Joanne, we, I think most people have seen the jelly bean slides for the equity mm -hmm. markets, but now you put one together here. Um, yes, we it, like this. This is a new addition for us, this is the quilt chart. It, it just, it, we think it just clearly illustrates the amount of variation in annual performance among the high yield industry sectors. We show 10 years of performance here, rank order all of the industries from best to worst each year, and then also show the best to worst range near the top of the slide, uh, which in many years is quite significant. So the message here is that sector selection is key to outperforming in high yield a key determinant in return attribution. Um, and the sector's returns vary a lot year to year, uh, depending in large part among, uh, upon the underlying fundamentals. And when I look at this quilt chart with my background in high yield, I can tell you that the worst performers each year, and you see energy down at the bottom, a lot of those years, and now it's back at the top, um, but when it was the worst, it was because they were experiencing significant fundamental or relative value weakness that got them down there. Um, but then the, the worst performers in any given year can be among the best performers in subsequent years as their level of distress dissipates and their fundamentals rebound. Yeah, great, great point. Um, Joint, we, we got a minute. Uh, Sid's got a question. He's asking, can you please share your thoughts on maturity schedule of the high yield index? What do you think? 
Yeah, we had a slide for that, that the maturity, um, the, the maturity uh, for high yield bonds in terms of the refinancing, it's, it, there's just, there's a low level of maturities over the next couple of years. Companies have spent the last five years doing a lot of refinancing of their existing debt. So it's just been something that has put them in better shape. I think the first year that we really see uh, bigger maturities in high yield bonds and loans is 2025. So there's some time between now and then. And in the meantime, you know, companies are continuing to refinance, pushing their maturities out further. So it's not like a huge risk right now. And that's, that's, that's a big thing to say. Okay, so we looked at sectors. You know, let's look at credit right. ratings as far as performance. Right. Yep. You know, there's been very similar wide dispersion trends among high yields three credit rating credit rating categories over the past ten years. Triple C's and double B's passing the top spot back and forth between them um, over the past ten years, and single B's in the middle position seven out of ten years. Again, this this demonstrates the way investors can outperform with their high yield positioning by tactical positioning in their credit rating exposure and high yield. Yeah, very good. OK, mm -hmm. um, this was great, Joanne. We'd love to bring Ben back in and and talk specifically about some of your strategies, Ben. Uh, walk, walk us through it and uh, I know you have a lot of choices and you continue to bring new choices to the marketplace. Uh, what can advisors get from this? Thanks, Tom. Yeah, well, I mean, listening to Joanne and and talking about the, the confidence that we have internally or our view of, of soft landing, strong balance sheets, and all of these different opportunities when choosing the right sectors, we've developed products that really allow you to express views. So what we've done is taken the broad uh, high yield indexes, uh, just like we're in single funds back in 2007 when these products first came to market, and we've broken them into two product suites. So the first product suite is uh, that broad high yield index broken into seven sectors. Um, and Tom, if you go to the next slide for me here, you know, we're, we're always talking to clients about um, how to utilize uh, the sector funds. And we, we always emphasize that, that using the right sectors or the right credit ratings can really lead to material performance implications on their funds. Um, so, you know, if you're thinking you want to take advantage of uh, consumer strength in, in the current environment, uh, our consumer discretionary or consumer cyclical products might be a really great great place to make an allocation. Um, also, if you're looking at the energy market uh, and you want to take advantage of higher average credit ratings that energy offers, um, really strong outlook in terms of the, the pricing of the underlying commodity um, and fundamental strength in terms of balance sheet, which tends to be better in that sector, uh, energy is a great place to, to make an allocation. Um, you know, additionally, the, the industrial sector has performed really strongly in this in this current environment. So uh, we see some folks uh, making allocations there as well. Um, in the case that picking the right sector and, you know, moving across Joanne's jelly bean chart, as you called it, Tom, uh, in the right way at the right time feels like it, it might be a little much for you. We do have a, a, a product in filing uh, that will provide active sector allocation exposure for you. So happy to happy to go into that more, yeah. reach out to us, not a live So, So before we move on to the next slide, you got a couple of questions. First of all, I, I think the fact that you hit on energy and it has been, there are times when it's been a little bit tough, seems pretty stable today. Um, and, you know, the, you look at oil prices, you look, you look at clean energy. I know you get a little bit of all of that. Could you dig a little bit deeper as far as the opportunities, maybe in energy, and and then also um, when you look at areas like uh, industrials, I mean, that's also seems to be in pretty good shape. I, I'm not asking you to pick your uh, most loved children here, Ben, 
but just a couple that you might be able to add a little bit more flavor to. Sure. I, I think um, the, you know, one of my favorite opportunities in energy is, is really the, the rising star uh, opportunity because, you know, with oil prices being higher recently for, for a while, there's, there's been a lot of upgrades and the sector has done really well um, as, as a result as, as companies are able to refinance and, and, you know, get their balance sheets in better order. Um, like I said, that sector is, is really above um, the, a lot of the high yield peers in terms of its uh, credit strength or, or its, its balance sheet strength. Um, I think industrials is is a, a great place as well. It's it's really core to the economy, um, and and it's it's proven to be very resilient. You know, it's it's I think more of a broad bet. It is the the biggest subsector um, of of them all. Um, so it's it's a little less um, acute than uh, cyclicals or discretionary. So so it's a little bit more of a broad bet on the economy, in my opinion. Um, but yeah. So we're we're going to talk a little, and, and I've got other some other questions about broad-based high-yield indices because basically you're getting a smorgasbord of all the sectors, and and why that might be good or might why it not it may not be good. But briefly, Ben, touch on liquidity because if you've got a sector allocation and you look at all these different choices, is there enough liquidity? Are there enough choices in these areas? Sure. So we, you know, we we've seen really great flows into these funds, um, especially as the market is starting to move more risk on. So you know, over over the last couple of months, um, we we've, we've seen really big inflows into the sector funds. And I I think in um, in this industry and and in the ETF world, there's a misconception that lower volume equals lower liquidity. And and frankly, that's just not true. Uh, and and it's you know have solid evidence that, that that's not true with um, few really big institutional trades coming into these funds and constant small, uh, more retail oriented or retail sized trades coming in and everyone being able to execute within on screen levels that we have. Um, and, you know, the the infrastructure that sits behind these products uh, is is very robust. We have the best market makers in the industry providing liquidity on these funds and, and able to source the bonds that we need. Uh, to build them with. So, you know, it's been a really good case, I think. And um, I hope we're, we're seeing more confidence across the board in fixed income and specifically high yield ETFs uh, over the last few years. So, Ben, we, we talked about sectors. Uh, you also offer credit rating ETFs. So walk us through them, if you would. That's that's right. My Folks who know me know I love analogies, and to me, this is the uh, this is the hot sauce basket here uh, to pick your pick your level level of spice. Um, you know, I, I listening to Joanne and and thinking about views or expressing views on on where to make allocation. Um, the the ratings products provide great opportunity for people. You know, not making thing not making bets as specific as industries that they like. But, but generally just picking their level of risk, picking their level of spice in high yield. So, you know, the, the double B product is a, a great place to put um, money if you're a little worried. You, you still want that, that yield that high yield presents, um, but you're a little worried about the economy. You're not sure if we're gonna have a hard landing or a soft landing, but you wanna increase the yield in your portfolio a bit. Um, triple C, you know, again, given what we've heard from Joanne, and, and our view here at Bombbox that we're going to have a soft landing, that corporate balance sheets are in really great position. You know, we we're talking to a lot of clients and really strongly recommending a consideration of Triple C in in a lot of different portfolios because we have a good outlook uh, for the future. So, um, and and single B is is a great place in the middle if uh, if you want to um, kind of hedge your bet and and be somewhere in the middle, get more yield but not go all the way down to Triple C. Uh, single B is, a, is kind of a sweet spot there uh, for you. And, and of course, the other opportunity is to use all three of them and, and express a different exposure than you might get in the typical broad market uh, ETF. You know, these products that have been around for, for over a decade where your weightings of each sector are fixed. You can really customize uh, by using all three in conjunction. Okay, so uh, 
XB might be Tabasco, where uh, XCCC might be uh, the Ghost Pepper or the Carolina Reaper? There's, there's a lot more yield. At, at some point, my analogy breaks down because I wouldn't recommend dumping a bunch of uh, ghost pepper onto your sandwich. But, um, <laughs> but you know, it, it, that's exactly right. There's, there's more yield. The, the, the yield profile in triple C is around 13 percent. Um, that fund is one of the top performing uh, fixed income ETFs year to date uh, because of its yield, uh, you know, because of that, that uh, income component that Joanne talked about earlier that, that defines these these lower quality higher yielding products yeah but I, I think kind of what joanne was saying before there are times there there may be time for ghost pepper based on what's going on in the economy as well so uh, I, I, I i like your analogy because it uh, at, at the same time if you've got the tools and you have precision kind of what joanne was talking about before uh as advisors today um uh, You've got so much more sophistication, innovation to be able to pick what's right for the times. And I know, Ben, that's kind of what you and I talked about before. That's that's exactly right. And that's, again, going back to why our company was founded and, and what we want to provide for investors or what we felt was really missing for investors is the ability to, to provide those customizations and, and let folks express their own view. So, you know, it, typically, if, if you were going to buy a, a market cap weighted High yield index that you know the old funds that have been around for a while you're fixed in about a, a 10 to 13 percent triple c exposure there and and you know i think triple c is just a great thing to it, it's a very polarizing um sector because if if people are really adverse to it you have to remind them that market cap weighted indexes have about 10 to 13 percent triple c so you, you own that if you own one of these broad funds um and if you like that, maybe you should put a little bit more in there. Or if you don't like it, maybe you should just be using the double B or single B products uh, to stay away from that end of the market. And, and again, it's really about precision. It's about ability to express your view. Yeah, that's great. Joanne, love to have you come back in while Ben and I were just over at the cooking channel. What, what are some of the takeaways <laughs> we, we should have here? Yeah, but before I before I do that, in terms of triple C's, before we launched this uh, triple C uh, ETF, there was no way to build a diversified fund of triple C's. You know, certainly picking individual triple C names are riskier, considering their higher potential default or idiosync idiosyncratic risk. But with an index fund like ours, you can get exposure in a diversified way. So that's you know, one of the, the strengths that we, we see um, about, yes, take more risk, but you could do it in a way you couldn't do it before. So, but in terms of any concluding remarks, um, we, we really appreciate being here. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, Vetify, for inviting Ben and myself to be here today. And, you know, really on behalf of our entire team at Bomb Blocks, we just sincerely appreciate our partnership with you. And we hope that everyone listening to uh, this webinar found it helpful and informative and that we got our messages across clearly about why we still think it's time to invest in, who, in U.S. high yield, especially if you pick your exposures. So, you know, with that, you know, thank you again for joining yeah. us today. Well, we've got we've got some great um We've got some good questions, and uh, we're going to put up a final polling question here. Uh, and again, we appreciate all the feedback that we're getting from the advisors and the institutions on the call. But which of the following Bond Blocks ETF suites would you be interested in learning more about? And in this case, you can select all that apply to you. And while while we have that up there, Joanne, I want to lob a. A, a very easy question over to you because I think I know where you're going. <laughs> but look, <laughs> but look, um, we, you've been in the ETF business for a long period of time. I think we're all fans of ETFs. But if you look today, where um, the majority of the money in the fixed income allocation is, it's still in traditional indexes, and. Uh, when you think about what we've gone through and you think about where we are today and when you think about the, the inside allocations of those ETFs, 
What what's most concerning to you? Uh, is it the amount of money that's in index-based strategies? Is it uh, the fact that in many cases it's cap weighted, which means, you know, especially from a corporate side, why are we awarding companies that have the most amount of debt the biggest allocation? And then from a sector balancing standpoint, you really don't have an opportunity within these broad based indices to be able to overweight or underweight sectors the way you can with your strategies. Right. Yeah. I think. What, how I'd want to answer that is that um, the broad base index high yield ETFs, I mean, they're, they're certainly a great tool for liquidity management, um, but they're not necessarily, you know, like what you could do with our funds, which we really think bring um, high yield ETFs to the next generation, is you can place active, put together active positioning with index tools. So it's just, it's a different strategy. It's not just a, like, a oh, buy a small allocation of this to manage inflows or outflows or express your view on whether you think high yield's going up or down. It's, it's taking things to another level in terms of being able to use these as active management tools, even though they're index strategies. Yep. No, good, great, great points. Okay, um, so uh, here's here's a couple of questions, Joanne. I, I apologize if I throw them at you quickly because we've got a lot of good ones. What impact do you expect on the high yield market from tightening bank lending standards? Um, why haven't tightening lending standards already have a bigger impact? What do you think, Joanne? Yeah, well. Um, we think the main reason that tightening bank lending standards haven't caused high yield spreads to wine is that the tighter lending standards are primarily impacting smaller, lower rated or loan only borrowers, not the public high yield market. So, um, you know, and despite much lower high yield new issuance than in peak years, capital activity has increased or it picked up from last year. Um, so high yield companies are continuing to be able to refinance in the current environment. And again, we've talked about uh, debt maturities, at least for the next two years, debt maturities are low um, that require refinancing. And so that's also something that provides technical support in the current environment for high yield over loans. Okay, um, so here's another good question for you, Joanne. Uh, what do you believe to be the dangers or risks to your still constructive outlook for the U.S. high yield market? So uh, I think what they're probably asking is, what's keeping you up at night right now? Well, actually, I'm, I'm not really kept up at night right now about this, but I, it, there's always... I think earlier in the year, we were talking a little bit more about the potential for a full-blown credit crunch um, that would hurt all risk assets, including high yield. Um, you know, other risks, I mean, you just, unforeseen stresses to specific industries that end up being pervasive enough that they end up uh, repricing all of high yield. But, you know, that's something like, yeah, I can't lose sleep over that now because it's, I, I, I don't see something like that. Um, it has happened before though, like with telecom, with energy, or finally like a, a hard landing economically. But again, you know, we think the risk there has lessened. Okay. Hey, Ben, uh, we have advisors that like to hear what other advisors are doing. We have advisors on periodically with ETF issuers that talk about what they've gone through from a due diligence standpoint, how do they utilize tools in the portfolio. If you would, share a little bit about um, how clients are utilizing your your ETFs in the in portfolio so far. Like, uh, what, what has surprised you as far as the adoption of Bond Blocks ETFs and, and the utilization? Yeah, I, I think there's, there's probably two basic camps that we're seeing folks go into and and it's it's somewhat related to their their 
resources and and their sophistication. We, one camp is um, you know kind of throw away market cap weighted exposures, put money into sectors and and manage it themselves. Um, you know we you can see that through some of our flows um, in in the growth of funds and and not being totally symmetrical to. Um, the, the market cap exposures, um, you know, that does take quite a lot of talent and time to, to be able to make sector bets and maintain them and, and stay on top of them. Um, I think the, the other camp is, is more of a, a simple overlay to maybe an existing exposure. Um, so, you know, taking a core ag or broad bond exposure and trying to get a little bit more yield by going to the the hot sauce basket and, and picking your, your risk tolerance and adding a little double B or, um, you know, some triple C. We've seen decent inflows on that fund recently uh, because I think folks do have more confidence. Similarly, we, we see people buying one-off sector funds because, you know, they really believe the energy story or they, they really have a lot of confidence in uh, the consumer sectors uh, given all of the data, all the economic data that we've, we've seen coming out. So, um, you know, I, I would say it's either uh, some people jumping all the way in or, or some people easing in uh, to the areas that they're more comfortable with, uh, with an overlay. Yeah, that's that's good. That makes sense. Uh, Joy, back to you. And we've got a few questions along this line, but I'll pick one. Um, if the U.S. heads into a more pronounced economic slowdown in the coming months or quarters, how much do you think high yield spreads could widen? And do you think... Mm -hmm this uh, fear about potential spread widening is the reason why some high yield investors haven't increased their allocation to this asset class? That's a, that's a great question. Yeah, and, and that that is, you know, like the fear of spreads widening in connection with the U.S. economy entering a recession or a more pronounced slowdown is probably the reason why some investors are still on the, sli on the sidelines. Um, you know, and even though spreads could widen from here, especially considering the amount of tightening that uh, we've seen, experienced this year, uh, there is room for them to widen from current levels in the asset class still to generate attractive total return performance. Once again, reflect, reflecting the elevated coupon income and the cushion that provides uh, for high yield. And, you know, I think I said it earlier in the presentation, but think I should restate it, that we think that there uh, remains decent support for spreads in the like 400 to 500 basis points over treasuries range for a broad index. Uh, you know, again, you know, with an economy that continues to prove resilient and corporate earnings that have held up and strong consumer and low unemployment and finally moderating inflation. So, Joanne, this is a great way to end it, but if you were to be sitting across the table from an advisor who had that fear, um, what would you advise them? I mean, it, is it back to uh, folks trying to top tick rates, or do we just take a, beat, a big deep breath and understand that we just don't have that ability? Rarely do people have the ability to, to pick highs, and that sure. just being able to, over time, uh, gradually make a, co uh, a commitment, w w what would you advise? Well, you know, they, they, could just, they could just pick and choose their spots within high yield. Again, you know, it does have this performance advantage in terms of its coupon income that enables them to, in, in most market environments, you know, do better than other areas of fixed income. So maybe if they wanted to, if they really were concerned about the U.S. economy, maybe they would want to stick to um, double B-rated risk or uh, the energy sector or some of the other higher quality um, industry sectors. So, yeah. you know, I think that's what I would recommend to them. So if, if you're... If we happen to be describing you right there, I would just tell you this, the folks at Bond Blocks have some wonderful people who have wonderful tools that can help you put together scenarios so you can actually model this out based on uh, a soft landing or uh, maybe more trouble in the economy. And, and look, 
Um, I, I know we didn't talk about this ahead of time, Joanne and, and Ben, but if somebody wanted help in analyzing their fixed income portfolio and what these tools might look like in different scenarios, you've got the tools to help them with that, right? Absolutely, we'd love to help. Yeah. Absolutely. So, so I'm gonna just throw this out there and maybe you're gonna yell at me later, but if somebody wants help analyzing their income portfolio, just type into the Q&A section, analyze me, and then somebody <laughs> from Bond Blocks will reach out to you and help you with that. Because look, these are tools that haven't been around before and uh, you might find that from a consultative standpoint, these folks are really, really great. Uh, please take advantage of that. So folks, we're at the top of the hour. Um, I wanna thank you all for being here. We wanna be respectful of your time. So thank you for being with us. I wanna thank our partners at Bond Blocks um, and our ongoing growing relationship there. Please make sure you go and see their channel at Vetify. We update editorial um, comments and, and great strategy ideas on a regular basis. And then uh, most importantly, Ben, Joanne, thanks for being here. This was perfect, perfect timing based on what's going on in the market and look forward to catching up with you both soon. Thank you. Thanks Thank so you much, so Tom. much. Tom. Thank you.